there could be liquid oceans in the moons of Uranus. Saturn takes the lead for the most moons in the solar system, and Webb gazes into the eye of Sauron. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. The search for life in the solar system is now really centering on the moons with liquid water under a thick shell of ice. Think about Europa and Enceladus, but even dwarf planets like Pluto and Charon and maybe Ceres. Liquid oceans could be everywhere across the solar system, and now astronomers think they found liquid oceans under the ice on the moons of Uranus. So obviously, the last time we visited Uranus was with the Voyager 2 spacecraft, which flew past in 1986. And like, it was just a flyby. We got this flight past the planet, some long distance shots of the moon, and then that was it. And nobody has gone back to this or Neptune since then, which is ridiculous. But planetary scientists had a lot of really great data that was gathered by the Voyager 2 spacecraft when it made its flyby. And so then they compared the observations that were made by Voyager 2 to the kinds of observations that were made from the Cassini spacecraft and Galileo and the Dawn mission and New Horizons. And then they took all of that data and they put it into giant computer simulations to try and figure out what kinds of surface features would map onto the possibility of there being a liquid ocean under this ice shell. And based on the simulation, they predict that four of Uranus's moons have liquid oceans underneath. But like, We've only been there once, and we really need to go back. And so far, there are no concrete plans to go back to Uranus by anyone. So now we've got potential evidence for liquid water on the moons of Uranus. We've got other plans for deep space missions, new technologies coming online. Like, is this enough? Is this what it's going to take? Can we please have a mission to go to the outer solar system to visit either of the ice giant planets, please, please. Speaking of moons, we got quite the announcement this week came from a bunch of researchers at the University of British Columbia. They discovered an additional 62 moons at Saturn, not a total of 62 moons, an additional 62 moons. So bringing the total count of moons at Saturn to 145. For the longest time, Jupiter was the planet with the most moons of the solar system. And then fairly recently, Saturn took the lead. And then Jupiter regained the lead at 95 moons. And so now Saturn has decided just to sweep the whole competition at an additional 62 moons. It's believed that many of these moons came from some kind of collision around Saturn, where some large ice moon was broken into many pieces. There are a bunch of these moons that follow in a retrograde orbit around Saturn. So something came in from outside the Saturnian system, crashed into one of its existing moons, shattered into a bunch of pieces, and now these pieces are being tracked. They're found in very unusual orbits that are above and below the plane of where you would normally find Saturn's moons, which is why they took so long to discover them. So 145 moons for Saturn. Your move, Jupiter. Webb stares into the eye of Sauron. Astronomers have found many really interesting star systems out there in the Milky Way, but there are just a few that are very close and very exciting. And probably one of the most exciting is this star called Famahot. It is only 25 light years away, very bright, visible with the unaided eye, and it's about twice the mass of the sun. And for the longest time, astronomers have known that there is some kind of dusty, cloud or disk surrounding the star. And we got really some legendary images from the Hubble Space Telescope. And this star was dubbed the Eye of Sauron from the Lord of the Rings series. And of course, this is the ideal target to point with the James Webb Space Telescope. It's designed to look through dust to see what's going on. And we got those images this week. What JWST found was a bunch of concentric rings of dust believed to be the kind of material from forming planets. Now, they didn't directly see planets, but with this level of resolution, they were able to see the regions where planets were likely forming. And we've seen other images like this from the ALMA instrument, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, which has been able to show dozens 
of these newly forming planetary systems, but they're all really far away, very low resolution. And so with Fallen Hope, we've got a star that is very close and with JWST in very high resolution. And so this is the kind of place that's very close by that astronomers can study how planet formation works up close. I want to make a quick note that when we did a video about the 100 days of JWST, I had been looking through the upcoming schedule from JWST's observations and noticed in the list that they were going to be observing Fomalhaut. And there's some really cool sites that you can get to see where the telescope is observing. You can see just hour by hour what its targets are, what instruments it's using. And there's some really cool target, like just this week, for example, I took a quick look through. There's uh, an observing run plan for formal Hout, which is a star that kind of looks like the eye of Sauron. You, you're probably familiar with the star. Wouldn't you love to see the web version of this? I would. And so I'm so glad that we finally got those images. I've been waiting a long time for specifically this research. James Webb fails to disprove the Big Bang. I'm sure you're aware that JWST has been finding a lot of massive galaxies early on in the universe, like galaxies as big as the Milky Way, as massive as the Milky Way, but seen just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. And researchers were calling this universe breakers because there shouldn't be galaxies this early on in the formation of the universe. It's expected that you'd see smaller galaxies, they'd be coming together like building blocks and to form larger and larger galaxies. In fact, I actually did an interview with one of the researchers here on this channel. We talked about these galaxies, how surprising they were compared to the existing models of the early evolution of the universe and how astronomers would need to go back and reanalyze the various pieces that come together to form these first galaxies. But those ideas of the early formation of the universe are based on simulations where astronomers take the initial conditions of the Big Bang, and then they create a giant simulation and they run it forward and try to recreate the universe at various stages and match it up with the observations that have been made. And it works very well for certain time periods, but we haven't been able to see far enough back into the universe to see how well it's able to accurately measure those. But the quality of your simulation depends on the power of your supercomputer. And are you trying to simulate like a large amount of galaxies at a very rough level? Or are you trying to simulate a very small amount of space with a high degree of accuracy? Astronomers used a simulation of the universe called Renaissance, which runs on a giant supercomputer, one of the most accurate simulations that's ever been created. And they were able to confirm that actually, the observations made by JWST fit nicely in the simulated versions of the cosmos that they had been working on. Nothing is outside the extreme. Nothing disproves the Big Bang or specifically disproves the Lambda CDM model of the universe. And so it's nice to get confirmations of some models and a disproval of other models. And this is how astronomy moves forward. You make these predictions with your theories, you try to simulate try to get a sense of what you might see in different kinds of evidence. And then you actually make the experiments or in this case, make the observations with a really powerful telescope to figure out which of your models are on the right track, and which of them are on the wrong track. And so we've got more evidence that the Big Bang is correct. Plans for a new private space station. The race is still on to build the first private space station that will orbit Earth that rich people can fly in rockets to space, spend a few days, weeks, months in orbit, return to Earth and get a chance to see the planet gain that perspective of our entire Earth without boundaries. And like it's an example, you've got Inspiration 4, where a team of four astronauts spent three days in space, like you go all this training, you go to space, you only get to spend three days and then you have to return. Uh, it would be nice to go longer. So a company called Vast is planning to build a private space station that they're calling Haven One. And the plan is to launch it on a Falcon 9 rocket sometime around 2025. It'll have a docking module capable of hosting a Crew Dragon spacecraft. And so you can imagine instead of spending just a couple of days in space, you launch dock with this space station, spend up to 30 days in orbit before returning to Earth. 
So take a look at this picture. It's a Crew Dragon XL and we got like a picture, a brief mention of it, and then nothing. And so it really kind of seems like Haven One is inspired by the Crew Dragon. I wonder if there's some kind of technology transfer going on here. Now, in addition to just being a hotel in space, they're going to provide a bunch of other services to astronauts that come on board. They're going to provide power, scientific connections, Wi-Fi, and maybe even some level of artificial gravity, like maybe lunar level gravity on Haven One. But their long term plans are to connect a whole bunch of these into a ring that's about 100 meters across and then maybe provide stronger artificial gravity in space. And I mentioned this last week in Space Bites, the idea of like, couldn't you just bolt together a whole bunch of starships and create a giant rotating ring? Sure, just why don't they just why don't they just launch a starship, maybe launch two starships and tie them together and have them spin around or maybe like nail 15 starships together and put them in a big loop that's spinning and you just exist inside like we got to get somewhere from here. And so it's nice to see that somebody is planning something very similar. So there could be like we've talked about this so many times, like the one big unknown about flying into space is a lack of artificial gravity. We know that weightlessness is bad for your body. And so we've got to figure out how much artificial gravity is good for your body. It'd be great to start with lunar gravity and then maybe move up to Martian gravity, or maybe it's going to take full Earth gravity for the human body to last a long time in space. So I'm hoping we'll find out more with this mission. A water powered engine raises its orbit. So we got an announcement this week that a space tug in orbit called Vigoride has fired its water based propulsion system a total of 35 times since it launched. And using this, it's been able to raise its orbit just a couple of kilometers and compensate for the atmosphere drag that it's experiencing at its altitude. What's really exciting about this propulsion system is that it's just water. It's solar powered. And so it uses the solar energy to create electricity, to create microwaves, to heat up water, and then fire this out of the spacecraft as a vapor, providing acceleration. Obviously, there are more convenient ways that you can provide a propulsion system like traditional chemical rocket system or ion engine or things like that. But what's great about this system is that you're using solar power to generate the heat to fire the water vapor out of the rocket. And so it is very simple and it's very safe. Like you think about people who are going to be working with the propellant, they could drink the propellant while they're refueling the spacecraft. But also there are a lot of resources of water out there in space. Think about asteroids and comets, the permanently shadowed parts of the moon. And so if they can get this technology working, they could fly out to some asteroid, refuel the reserves, use the energy from the sun and be able to carry on their mission. And so with constant refueling, you could imagine satellites like this just operating forever around the solar system. So you probably noticed we've been doing a lot of interviews recently. And I think that the interviews are some of the most important work that we do here on our channel. Like this is journalism. I am reaching out to the scientists who are doing the work that you are seeing reported here and in other places and hearing directly from them what the work they're doing, having them explain it in terms that we can understand it. And we're learning new things that we don't find out anywhere else. And like, that's my job as a journalist. And so when I do these interviews, you get to come along for the ride and learn about this stuff at the same time that I do following my curiosity. And a lot of people say that, oh, the QAs are very introductory, the space bites, like that's great, but they're very short. The interviews are the advanced material, the stuff that will help you really understand in depth the work that astronomers and space scientists and planetary scientists and exoplanetary researchers and astrobiologists are working on. So definitely come and check out. And of course, one of the most interesting things that we're doing is our NIAC series where I'm interviewing the principal investigators behind each one of the recently awarded NIAC prizes. Each of these are really interesting technologies, out of the box thinking, ways to advance humanity into space in ways that nobody's ever worked on before. So I think you'll find these interviews are really fascinating. Of course, our patrons get advanced access to these interviews as well as other special benefits, behind the scenes information. So if you haven't already, check out our interviews. We've got a playlist that you can follow. And if you want to support the work that we do, 
go to patreon.com slash universe today. China's secret space plane is back on Earth. In last week's questions and answers show, you watch the questions and answers shows, don't you? Uh, I talked about the X 37 B and speculated on what it's for and what it does. And I'll put a link to that episode here. But did you know that China has its own space plane? We don't know what it's called. Uh, so we'll just call it the Chinese space plane. We got this really short announcement from the Chinese space agency this week about the space plane. Essentially, it launched from the Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center in the Gobi Desert on August 4th, 2022, and then returned on May 8th. That's it. Like, that's all we got 276 days in orbit. Like, we don't know the name, we don't know any other information. But when you launch things into orbit, people can see and track. And so there was a lot of information that had been gathered by other sources, including the US Space Force, uh, and other private observers watching this thing fly overhead. And one of the interesting things that it did was at some point it released some smaller satellite. It also performed a couple of maneuvers changing its orbit slightly. We don't know what this thing looks like. And so every picture that you see of it during the story is not real. I just had mid journey hallucinate a bunch of space plane images. Some of them are pretty cool looking. I hope they look like this. Finally, we got a couple of really cool videos that I think you should watch. So the first is drone footage of a rocket lab electron rocket lifting off from their New Zealand facility. It's got their twin tropic CubeSats on board. And these are designed to study tropical hurricanes. And Rocket Lab comes up with hilarious names for the missions. And in this case, it's called Rocket Like a Hurricane. And then the second video comes from the recent Falcon heavy launch of the Viasat three satellite. And what was different with this launch was that no part of it was reused. So the, the two side boosters, the central core, they all were fired completely. No fuel left to make a safe landing. Falcon Heavy used a previously flown fairing. And like, this is the first time that Falcon Heavy has ever used a secondhand fairing. And fortunately, they were able to recover this fairing, even though at one point it was traveling like 15 times faster than the speed of sound, clearly experiencing a lot of heat as it was re entering the atmosphere and put out its parachute and landed gently in the ocean and they were able to recover it. So these are the kinds of forces. This is what it would kind of feel like to be returning from orbit re entering the Earth's atmosphere. All right, those were all the stories that we had today. If you want to do a deep dive into any one of these stories, we've got links in the show notes down below. You can get even more space news on my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word, there are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at university.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the University Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at university.com slash podcast or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent and keeps ads at a bare minimum. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to just Paul Davis, Vlad Shipelin, Jay Dennis, David Giltanen, Modso, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbioff, Andrew M. Gross, and Josh Schultz who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us. All right, that was all the news for today. We'll see you next week.